Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary. You have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. Though you do not now see Him, you believe in Him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Hey church, it's a privilege to be able to spend another Sunday with you and your families in your home. And, and as we're on week six of gathering within our homes by ourselves or with our spouse or with our families, let me encourage you with a few things reminding you of the significance of what you're doing. The, the first is every week that you set apart time to study God's word and to worship him and, and to fix your eyes on him, you're reorienting yourself to true north. You're anchoring yourself to a true hope. You're reminding yourself of the salvation that comes through faith in Jesus. And this is an important discipline that's, that's uh, been participated in by God's people since the very beginning of, of the church, gathering together and, and even digitally, gathering together and, and considering the things of God, seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness and, and trusting that all those other things he'll add to us. And, and the reality is, is, is that's important for us as individuals to anchor us uh, to a hope. The second thing is if you have kids in your home or if you have a roommate or your spouse, you're modeling for them the importance of pursuing God's kingdom first. You're modeling for them the importance of setting some healthy rhythms in your life that, that demonstrate an active and robust and meaningful faith. And so I'm, I'm praying for you as you meet this morning within your home, as you grab your cup of coffee or as, as you made cinnamon rolls or toast or bacon or now you're all hungry, you can push pause on this video, you can go make breakfast and come back. But wherever you're at in your home, know that I'm praying for you this morning that God would use our time together in our study. Additionally, we're trying to resource our families to continue dialogue with their kids, to disciple their kids, to teach their kids. We love serving your kids on Sunday morning in Kids Life. And it's, it's grieved our teacher's heart, it's grieved my heart that we can't partner with you in, in a more tangible, physical way on these Sunday mornings. But we are resourcing you on our website, www.summitlifeseattle.com. And there's, there's some guides that you can walk through, videos, short videos that you can provide for your kids to just kind of condense uh, some teaching, meaningful teaching to them. Additionally, we're providing right now media to you. You've probably received a couple emails from me. It's not junk, it's not spam, it's a, it's a incredible database where you can find some really meaningful teaching. And what I would encourage you to do, parents particularly, and, and as we lean into a new sermon series and, and begin to do some character studies throughout the Old Testament, all you gotta do is type into the search bar the, the name of the individual that, that we're studying. This week we're gonna be studying Noah. Noah. As we study Noah, go to the search bar, type in Noah, you're gonna find some videos that would, that would pop up that you can utilize to, to teach your kids or be conversation starters for your kids so that they can grasp the significance of some of these stories that we're gonna be walking through. And so I, I, I hope you're encouraged. If there's any other resources we can provide for you, please don't hesitate to let me know. We want you to be fully equipped to handle the season that you find yourselves in. We love you, we're praying for you, and we're excited for how God's gonna use this in your life. This week, we begin a new sermon series, Walking Through, Anchored in Hope. The fact is, is that we as people in life can be tossed about by the waves of life and that can be incredibly disorienting. And so over the course of the next couple months, we're actually gonna work through the characters, some portrait characters of, of the Old Testament, people, men and women who were anchored in hope even in difficult seasons. 
You see, the things that make seasons difficult can be very unique. It's, it's difficult to experience the loss of a loved one, but it's a very different difficulty to experience the loss of a job. It's difficult to experience the pains of not knowing how you're going to pay your bills. It's a very different difficulty to, the ex to experience the pains and, and the, the heartache of, of a friend or a family member hurting you. And, and we're going to walk through these stories and see the unique difficulties that, that men and women of God have faced throughout history and how they were anchored in hope even in the midst of these circumstances. You see, the circumstances that are difficult that we find ourselves in maybe today, maybe tomorrow, maybe next month, or the years to come, we don't need to be tossed about and disoriented by them, but we can be anchored in hope. And so I ask you to join me as I pray and as we turn our attention to Genesis chapter 6. Let's pray. God, we are thankful. We're thankful for your grace. We're thankful for the hope that comes through faith in your son, Jesus. We're thankful for the hope that comes from knowing that you are still seated on the throne and that, that your eye is still on the sparrow. God, I pray this morning that you would renew the hope of our salvation. That you would renew the hope of, that we have in you. And Father, that anyone who's, who's feeling discouraged or, or experiencing despair, Father, that that despair would be washed away by a renewed hope that comes from fixing our eyes on you. God, would you use your word to shape us this morning? We ask these things in your name. Amen. Turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 6 and follow along as, as I read out of Genesis chapter 6. The text says, When man began to multiply on the face of the land and, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive and they took as their wives any that they had chose. Real quick, just this phrase, sons of God. Uh, there's, there's two primary interpretations of this. One of them is uh, the interpretation that, that these sons of God were fallen angels. Uh, that had just kind of perversely walked through life. We see that Peter and Jude reference this text and, and might give some indication that, that these would be uh, fallen angels. Additionally, uh, there's another interpretation of, of this uh, uh, phrase, sons of God, that they would be from the line of Seth and, and that they would be people who have been set apart by God that would come maybe from the genealogy in chapter 5. But, but regardless, we see that, that the depravity of man, that the sinfulness of man was without restraint. Continue to follow along as I pick up in verse 3. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. Then the Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterwards when the Son of God came in to the daughters of man, and they bore children to them. They were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. Verse 5, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I created from the face of the land, man and animals and creepy things and birds of heaven, for I am sorry that I have made them, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. You see, in this text, we see that the world is literally falling apart around Noah. See, the waves that would crash against Noah in his life would be the world around him falling apart. What, what is the effect of waves in our lives? I, I, just last summer, we took our very first fishing trip as a church. We went out to the Pacific Ocean to catch salmon, and we climbed onto the boat, and we make our way out of the channel, and, and all the adventurers just kind of work their way out of the cabin and out to the deck, and, and many of us made our way to the front of the boat, and every wave that crashed, you would have thought that we conquered another mountain. As, as we climbed the wave, you see here kind of just the build up, and, and as we crashed on the next wave, we go, <coughs> excuse me. Almost like Vikings taking a new land, right? In anticipation of, of what was to come. We, we, we believed that we were conquering and excited about the adventure ahead. But I knew in the back of my mind the, the, the devastating effects of, of waves in our life. Because just two years prior, I went fishing with my son Luke. And, and I was the adventurer on the outside of the boat and quickly made my way inside the boat because I started to feel unsettled internally. And, and, and then later that morning began to feed the fish with everything that I'd eaten 24 hours prior. 
So I'm hearing these, these buildups and, and these conquering noises, knowing that, that waves over and over and over can, can ultimately cripple and, and bench us from the work and the task at hand. And so I was cautiously celebrating these waves, but knowing that they had the effect to cripple us and to prevent us from engaging in the work at hand. And sure enough, later that morning, the waves effect, and some of those who were on the boat had caused them to feed the fish with everything that they'd eaten 24 hours prior and it had benched them from the work at hand. Not only can waves and, and, and the, the effects of storms in our life bench us from the work at hand, but, but it can also cause us to, to look backwards rather than looking forward to our future hope. And scripture is clear that our hope is always pointed towards the future. And in this text, we see the backdrop of Noah's story is the world is falling apart around him. See, when the world is falling apart, God's people are anchored to hope when they trust in God's plan. You see, see the, the world was falling apart because there was no restraint against sin. The text says that, that the Lord saw the wickedness of man was so great that every inclination of his heart was only evil all the time. God would underscore that again in verse 11. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and the earth was filled with violence. There was no restraint against sin. We almost see in the first few verses a parallel of how Eve dealt with temptation. She saw that the fruit was good and because it was pleasing to the eye, because it was good, she saw it was good and so she took of it. And in chapter six verses one through three, we see that, that these people see and, and, and it's, it's beautiful, it's attractive, it's good, and so they take anything that, that their heart finds attractive. And, and we see in the text that everything in their heart that they found attractive was, was a direct defiance and, and, and direct opposition of what God saw as good and pleasing. And so every inclination of their heart was only evil, all the time. In fact, in verse 1 of chapter 6, we would see that, that God had commanded in, in chapter 1 of uh, Genesis verse 28 to be fruitful and multiply. Why? Because he wanted the earth to be filled with worshipers and image bearers. And, and in chapter 6 verse 1, the earth is being filled, but it's being filled with sin, people who would directly defy and stand against the design and the plans of God. The world was unraveling around Noah. There was no restraint against sin, and so God would pronounce his judgment against that sin to Noah. There was a judicial judgment that would come on the world because of their rejection of God and his design. In the midst of this narrative and the whole world falling apart, we see this one verse that would build the story of Noah and, and his building of the ark and, and and we see the verse found in verse 8. Now, Noah found favor in God's eyes. See, there are four things about Noah's life that we can uh, see in, in this narrative, verses, or chapter 6 through 8. And we, in looking in, peering into Noah's life, can uh, gain a better insight on how to deal with a world that's falling apart around us. The first is this, that Noah did what was right according to God's plan. We learn in this text that Noah was righteous and blameless before God. Chapter 6, verses 8 and 9, he found favor in God's eyes. Noah was a righteous man. Verse 9, blameless in his generation. He walked with God. If we flip over to chapter 7, verse 5, we would see that Noah did all that God commanded him to do. And after the flood came in chapter 8, verse 16, we would see that God said, go out of the boat in verse 18 of chapter 8. So Noah did. Interestingly enough, Noah's relationship with God seemed very different than Abraham and, and Moses Abraham and Moses speaking back to God as God would give commands. But here in this text, Noah listened and he obeyed. Over and over again, Noah listened and he obeyed. He listened and he obeyed. God would give a command and he would obey. He lived a life of conviction, not a life of of convenience. He did what was right according to God's plans, not listening to the other voices and, and, and the culture around him that was spiritually and ethically and culturally bankrupt. 
But he lived a life of conviction, listening to the voice of God and then obeying the voice of God quickly and fully and completely. In our house, as our kids were growing up through their terrible twos, which weren't so terrible in our household, it was the threes that were really difficult. We would say to our kids, obey right away, all the way, cheerfully, every day. Now, you and I know that they didn't fully accomplish that statement. Still working on it. I'm still working on it. As a parent, I believe it's my responsibility to teach my kids how to obey so that when God calls them to do things, that they would be able to obey right away, all the way, cheerfully, every day. And, and that has to be something that's modeled in my life. And it certainly was something that Noah modeled in his life, something on full display for his kids and his family to see. He did not cut corners when it came to building the ark. He did not question God, although there must have been a number of questions that would have come to mind. He did not get uh, the most animals that he liked. He just simply obeyed God and the task that God had given to him. And, and when we think about the weight of what was being entrusted to Noah, it required obeying all the way, right away, cheerfully, every day. Why did it require that? I don't know if there was a task that's been entrusted to any human being other than Jesus. Jesus, God who became flesh, fully God, fully man. There's, there's no other one who's walked the earth that's been entrusted with a more important task. Like there was no plan B for God in regards to like a, a man who was almost righteous. But as we read the text, like Jonah was, or Noah was the guy. He was the guy who had found favor in, his, in God's eyes. He was the guy who, who had done right before God. Everyone else had, had abandoned and denied God's way, but, but Noah did what was right according to God. The second thing that we see in Noah's life is that he believed that God's plan would have prevailed. Why was it that Noah was able to obey like he did? Because he believed, he had faith that God's plan would prevail. See, I, I read the Old Testament narrative and, and see the characters throughout the story. And, and when I come to Noah time and time again, I think to myself, how, how would I have responded to, to God asking me to build an ark, to call the animals into the ark? After a period, I, I would begin to ask questions, maybe, maybe a week, maybe two weeks maybe a decade, maybe two decades, for 120 years, there would be the season of waiting upon God's promise to be fulfilled, but Noah believed that God's plan would prevail. Even though question after question may arise in his heart and the mind, he simply did the task. And the task required an immense amount of faith. It required faith to begin the building process of the ark. It required faith to enter the ark. It required faith to wait upon God for the waters to recede so that he might land on dry land again. And there's, there's no record in the biblical text of Noah questioning, doubting, or complaining against God's plan. He simply obeyed it because he had faith, and because of this, he's included in Hebrews chapter 11 as one who had faith, being sure of what he hoped for, even, even though he could not see it, certain of that which he could not see. He was sure of what he had hoped for. What he had hoped for was that God's promises would come to fruition, for God's word had come to Noah in chapter 6, that God was going to bring a flood, and that God would make a covenant with Noah and his family, sparing them from this flood. And, and Noah clinged to that promise for 120 years until the fulfillment of that promise came as the flood waters washed away the earth. And, and he continued to cling on to that promise believing that one day the, the waters would recede and that his family would be able to walk on dry land again. Have you ever believed something so much that you were willing to stake it all on that truth coming to reality? Like you, just, you just take everything you got and you just push it in and, and you say, I, I, I just I believe so much that, that this is going to happen, that, that should this not happen, I got no backup options. And that was the type of faith 
that Noah had regarding the plans of God prevailing even in the midst of a world that seemed to be unraveling and falling apart. We see in the narrative the third uh, principle in, in Noah's life that's displayed. He diligently persisted in God's plan. He diligently persisted in God's plan against culture, against pressures both internally and externally, against scoffers who would stand against him, and against the delayed fulfillment of the promise. See, the culture that surrounded Noah was spiritually, ethically, morally bankrupt. So here, here comes this man claiming that he has a word from God that they need to repent and believe or else judgment would come across the face of the earth. And, and you know that the culture was moving one direction and, and as, as Noah stood pointing back to the other direction saying, no, you need to go that way. There certainly would have been pressures that came against Noah. We see the pressures externally of, 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 of delayed fruit and, and the reality that for a season he didn't see evidences that the flood was going to come. And, and you know that that had to have created some sort of internal pressure. And while we don't read any questioning, any doubting, it's because he had to fight that within his own heart, I believe. Because he, like you and I, was called to obey. And, and we know that obedience is never easy. And as Noah was called to obedience, it's hard for me to, to walk away from the text thinking that this story is just easy. But he, he diligently persisted in God's plan when the culture pressed against him, when his internal pressures pressed against him, when scoffers would stand against him? How do we know that there were scoffers? Because Jesus compares this text to the way that it will be in the last day. In fact, I believe that there has not been a generation that is more spiritually bankrupt and corrupt and evil uh, since this time and probably won't be paralleled until the latter days of the tribulation. Jesus in Matthew chapter 24 verses 36 through 51 compares the events of, of Noah and the flood to the events that would lead to his second return. That there would be a warning that God would send for people to, to repent and, and believe in him and, and they would reject that and they would scoff. In the last days, there will be scoffers. And, and if, if Jesus is comparing this text to the way that it's gonna be in the last day, we know that he says in the last days there will be scoffers. And so certainly there were those that would scoff against this man who's building a boat without any signs or evidences of, of, a, of a flood. And the reality is, is that God's people are oftentimes met with scoffers. In fact, God's plans carried out by God's people are almost always met by scoffers. We see Nehemiah met by Sanballat, uh, mocking Nehemiah for the building of the wall, that a, that a fox could stand on the wall and it would crumble. We see Esther confronted by Haman who would stand against her and, and try to just eliminate the, the Jewish people. We see Joseph and his brothers, or David and his brothers, just scoffing at, at who they are as people. That God's people who are carrying out God's plans are almost always met with scoffers, and, and yet Noah persisted in obedience. Chapter six, he obeyed. Chapter seven, he obeyed. And chapter eight, he obeyed. He diligently persisted in God's plans. For he faithfully proclaimed God's plans. He faithfully proclaimed God's plan. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5 talks about how Noah was a preacher to his generation. He likely preached much like many of the other Old Testament prophets. We know that God is patient. We know that God is kind. We know that he's slow to anger and that he's abounding in love. And these character qualities do not change. They have not changed. And I believe that Noah, as he preached to his generation, spoke of, of God's repent of God's God's patience and, and longing for them to repent, wanting for them to turn from their ways and obey him. And and Noah faithfully proclaimed God's plan that there would be disaster. Uh, God would not relent from the disaster should you not relent from your own wickedness. There would be a consequence for your sin. And Noah, as he proclaimed it, was 
uh, much like Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, proclaiming to a, a people that would ignore and reject and, and deny everything that Noah would proclaim. And yet we see in Noah's life an unwavering commitment to faithfully proclaim God's plan. So much so that it's recorded in the New Testament that, that when thought of, when Noah's thought of, one of the characteristics that comes up in Peter is that he was a faithful preacher, one who proclaimed the plan of God. You see, in, in the life of Noah, the world unraveling around him, a spiritually bankrupt culture, we see that he did what was right according to God's plan, that he believed that God's plan would prevail, that he diligently persisted in the work of God's plan, and that he faithfully proclaimed God's plan. So what is it that we learn from Noah, and how is it that we can be anchored in hope when the world seems to be unraveling around us? Three things, real quick. The first is this. God's plans will prevail. People may scoff, pressures may come, but God's plan will withstand it all. See, it doesn't matter what waves come in our life. It doesn't matter what it looks like in the world around us. If we believe that God's plan is true and right and that it will prevail, then we have hope regardless of what the circumstances look like. You see, here's, here's, the, here's the challenge that we have as people. We oftentimes make our own plans and commit to our own ways. And, and those plans, as, as you and I know, oftentimes change. Not like I have every desire to get to the gym every year around January. <laughs> those plans change by the second week of January. Desire is still there, but the plans have changed. And so if my hope is in my plan, that plan is constantly going to be disrupted by the reality of life, by the waves and the circumstances of life. But if, but if my hope rests in the fact that God's plan will prevail, then that hope cannot be shattered until the return of Jesus, when my hope is realized as he's, he's coming in all of his glory. My hope being realized because I know that God's plans will prevail. The second thing that we learn from Noah's example is that we need to listen and obey the voice of God over the voices of man. We need to listen and obey to the voice of God, to, to tune our ear, to incline our ear towards the things of God. That if we had our, our ear pods in or our earbuds or whatever headphones set you use, that, that we would just kind of crank up the volume when it comes to, to the voice of God in our life as he speaks through his word. You see, there was only one during the time of Noah that was listening to the plans of God. There was only one. No one else had, had turned up the volume, had inclined their ear to the word of God. Only Noah. And as he inclined his ear to the word of God, he, he allowed that voice to be so loud in his life that that's what he held fast to. Not, not the other narratives, not the other voices, but he held fast to, to, to the promises that, that came through God's word, not, not the fears that came from man's word. See, we could even read Psalm 1. I encourage you to do it this week. Read Psalm 119. See, see how often uh, renewal and revival in Psalm 119 is associated and linked to the meditating on God's word. Psalm 1, one of my favorite psalms, right? A man who meditates on, on God's word day and night is like a tree planted by streams of water. His leaves do not wither. What causes leaves to wither? The, 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 the storms, the, 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 the elements of, of this life. That's what causes leaves to wither. But, but the man who meditates on the word of God day and night is like a tree planted by streams of water. The elements don't affect it. His leaves don't wither. In uh, all that he does prospers, and he bears fruit in the right season. So that's, what, that's what happens when we, when we turn up the volume on, on God's voice in our life, allowing his word to, to direct us. Third takeaway, that God is our deliverer. Not, not only 
that God's plan will prevail, not only that God's voice needs to be turned up in our life, but that our deliverance ultimately and fully will be found in God. You see, God warns uh, the generation around Noah. God similarly warns the generation around us in Matthew chapter 24, verses 37 through 39, saying that, that many people will just be doing their thing and then the Son of Man's gonna return. But in that moment, as we talked about a few weeks ago on Palm Sunday, for, for some, that's gonna cause them to, to, to fear, to be crippled by fear, but, but to others, it causes us to look up for the day of redemption has, has drawn near, that the hope of our salvation has come, that our deliverance has come, our deliverer is, deliverance is found in God. See, in any other deliverance, if, if the virus, uh, coronavirus was just wiped off the face of the earth, you and I would still have to one day face the reality of death. And if all, all of our other physical ailments were wiped away, and we would one day still be faced with the reality of, of death. And, and God in his might, God in his strength, God in his kindness has become our deliverer, removing the sting of death, which is sin according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And in removing that, that sting of, of, of death, which is sin, we can confront life and death knowing that there is hope that prevails, that God is our deliverer. See, it's, it's my prayer for you this season, or the season to come, or, or in the, the, the years to come, regardless of what waves would come against you. If the world in your life feels like it's falling apart, the waves crashing against your boat, that you wouldn't be benched and, and removed from the task and the work that God's called you to today. That you wouldn't look back for some sort of superficial hope in the past, but you would look forward to the prevailing hope that God is your deliverer. That you would look forward to the prevailing hope that God is, is your guide. It is he that's your good shepherd. It's his voice that will lead you. And that God is the one whose plans will prevail. See, no, no one knew that. And in the midst of an incredibly difficult circumstance, he was able to have hope because he trusted in God's plan. The question that we have to wrestle with today is, do we know and do we trust God's plan? A couple questions I would ask you to just kind of think through in the quietness of your home, whether it's by yourself or with a family member, with your whole family. First is this, what are some of the elements of Noah's life that would have made it uniquely difficult to trust God? What are the elements in Noah's life that would have made it uniquely difficult to trust God? Make a list, one, three, five. See, see if you can just keep adding one to it. You get five, go to six. Get to eight, make it a competition if you've got kids. See if you can get nine. After you make, make a pretty robust list of the elements that would have made it difficult for Noah uh, to obey and trust God. Uh, look at that list. Which, which on that list would you most identify with? The difficulties and th that are on that list that you might identify with. Yeah, this would make it really hard to, to trust God. I know for me, as I think through my list, the delayed fruit, or the perceived delay fruit always, makes it hard to believe that the seed in the ground is germinating and eventually the work under the ground is going to take root and, and someday I'm going to see the fruit. That's something I have to work with in my own life, which means I have to trust that, that God who began the work is going to continue the work and one day finish the work. Second question I'd ask you to think about in, in your home. Like God did for Noah, he has made his redemptive plans known to us. In our life group, we've talked a little bit over the last couple of weeks about clinging to the promises of God. Not the promises that, that God hasn't made, but the promises that God has made. God's also made his redemptive plan known to us. What would it take for you this week to, to make time to grow in your knowledge of God's redemptive plan? What would it take this week for you to take time to grow in your knowledge of God's redemptive plan? The second part of that question is, how can you keep the hope of that plan in front of you this week? Maybe it's putting a sticky note on your computer. Maybe it's 
Maybe it's writing on your, your mirror in your bathroom. Challenge our life group to memorize 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 8, the text that was read to us as we prepared for our study. That we would be reminded that God has a redemptive plan and that we would keep that hope in front of us, allowing that to be what we meditate on this week. Please, please know that I'm praying for you. I'm praying that this series uniquely speaks to your heart, speaks to your home, that maybe it equips you as parents to talk to your kids about the hope of our salvation. See, we have the opportunity to speak to our kids in, in, in a way that, that not only acknowledges the current reality of the world that we walk in, but points them to a future hope that's found through faith in Jesus. I, I love being a pastor. I love getting text messages from you, and, and I hope you've received some text messages from me. And I can't wait till we come together and together sing a song of hope, reminding one another that we can be anchored in all seasons of life. Let's close in prayer. God, we, uh, we rejoice. We rejoice even when the world is falling apart around us because your plans prevail. Father, that you still reign, that you are still working things out for the good of, of your people, that you're still drawing people to salvation. God, that you are still on the throne. Lord, we're thankful that your word has revealed to us a redemptive plan that we can hold on to, knowing that one day our hope will be realized as you return, as the bride is, is reunited to, to the groom, as the wedding feast is celebrated, as, as Revelation would describe. God, might our, our eyes be fixed on that truth, your redemptive plan that's, that's continuing to carry forward through the generations. And Lord, I pray that this morning you would remind us of that truth. Father, if there's anyone who's listening to this that doesn't know that truth, I pray that you would draw them to the hope of salvation through just trusting in Jesus, knowing Jesus and trusting in him. And Lord, those of us that, that know Jesus, might we renew our trust in him. We love you, Lord. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for you guys. I'm praying for you this week and I count it a privilege to serve as your pastor. God bless. Oh, hail the King, all oh, hail the Savior.